Madame la ministre. Madame Minister, dear friends, I am not going to go through the whole protocol list of titles that uh, you all have here today. But let me say how delighted we are at Ferdi to launch this uh, cycle of events ahead of uh, the June summit on the financing of vulnerable countries, which uh, is organized by Ferdi through the International Development Finance Architecture Chair. And uh, Mr. Philippe Leroux, who's uh, in charge of uh, this uh, chair, works uh, with a whole range of people. We can see uh, Mr. Leroy is here, Olivier Lafoucard as well, Jean-Michel Severino. Bruno Gabriac is not here today, as uh, he had uh, to take part in a, in a board of trustees uh, in Yaoundé tomorrow. And I might forget, yes, Rabba Reski, who was held up today in New York City, but uh, who will be online. So a whole group of people, of French personalities, uh, who've uh, uh, had, who uh, have uh, discharged uh, very important duties in the past, uh, but uh, all of them personally have accepted to convey one, indeed, several messages ahead of this summit uh, and have accepted uh, to take some time off from their other activities. So Ferdi is extremely proud and delighted to be able to rely on this chair and on these personalities, and uh, we hope we can do a useful job. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank the Ministry of uh, Europe and Foreign Affairs, uh, particularly uh, Mrs. Zakharapula, who is honoring us with her presence and who welcomes us uh, here in uh, the, uh, the Ministry's uh, uh, building. It's very important. It's a very important event because uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Finances have uh, accepted to support uh, this event, uh, this uh, brainstorming, and they've uh, uh, accepted uh, to help us despite uh, institutional uh, uh, constraints. And, and they've really accepted to, to help us because we want to, we'd like to know what institutions really think about this topic, despite or outside all constraints. So all participants here will uh, address you on an individual basis. And uh, this does not commit their institutions at all. Which means that although it's an independent initiative, it's been uh, supported by this ministry and by the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs. It's always very difficult for me to uh, fully uh, describe uh, the, the name of uh, the Ministry of uh, Finances and of the Economy. And again, I would I would like to express my warmest thanks on behalf of the Ferdi and the Chair uh, to these two ministries, particularly to the Secretary of State, uh, who honours us uh, with our presence here, who has um, graciously accepted to, to welcome us here and uh, who's here for the opening of this series of seminar. But uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Philippe Leroux. As you said, everything I wanted to say. So thank you all for coming. I wanted seriously to thank the French government via the Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Economy, Economics and Finance to have funded this whole series of seminars. I thank this idea as a kind of a think tank. I think it's a good idea. It's something that should be developed further in France so that people who've done some policy work in their lives can get together between research and the policy, applied research, or a mixture of those two, which I think is a good idea, moving towards more concrete things rather than fundamental research without, uh, as Patrick was saying, without the institutional constraints that we have when we're actually involved as a player. So it's a good thing. And so thank you once again to the ministry for sponsoring the series of seminars. Now to the series, this is the first of a series 
Thank you, Mrs. Minister, to have, first of all, contributed and also for being here, which is the most important thing is to be present here today, to kick this off, uh, the series, because we don't have much time between now and June. We're trying to fit that all in uh, by the 23rd of June, which is what I call the Macron sem uh, seminar for the development thing. But I think it's a good initiative and, and an important initiative because for months now, we've been hearing, you know, Washington, there have been, been rumors of refounding the architecture of assistance being provided, which worked pretty well since the Second World War. And so many things, a lot of water has gone under the bridge. If we had to do Bretton Woods in 844 today, we would not write the same thing. But we had that experience during these 100, 110 years. So how can we get this? That's kind of the basic idea of this group that we have here um, as a premise to think about that issue. So about the seminars, the series starting today, and the purpose of which is what uh, what is the destination for aid? That's the basic, uh, you know, the foundation. And then this week again, but a Friday, the 17th of March, there'll be the climate funding. I did a paper for that seminar Friday. And there's not much. We had to try to put figures to it. It's an incredible puzzle. I'll say a bit more about that later. And then in April, the diversification and fragmentation of public funding and development, which is, uh, which have had a lot written about it, but not much has been done. So that's kind of fragmented as well. And then a big current problem is debt, the debt crisis. That's in April as well. So a lot has been written about that and many speeches have been made about it. There's a problem of China, multilateral problem of China, and we're going to be proposing solutions. I've been working with another French think tank that's participating in that to uh, Devel Development Finance Lab. And Mr. Cohen and so forth are working on that. So we're going to be doing something on that finance development lab. And in May, there will be two others, public support for private funding. The problem with that is to try to increase the interest that the people have in 2015. We call billions to trillions. So so why and how? The system is not ready, and why isn't it? So these are issues that are important if we want to succeed in getting up to that value. We, we're talking about we need two or three trillion. But what we're looking at is we don't have that money. So how do we do it? How do we manage? So that's a key issue. And lastly, the last one before the summit will be the basis of the financial pact. Olivier de Vaughard, my friend, is going to be looking at that. So I think it's a good thing to look more closely at that and to link all of these things together. If we're looking at the debt, and there are various conditions involved in that. So that's the, the agenda to try to fit with the deadline of the summit. I'm going to stop at this point. I could talk a long time, but uh, I think uh, Mrs. Minister, Mrs. Minister, so happy to see you here. And the floor is now yours. Thank you. What's crazy is to do the same thing and to expect a different result. That remind you of something? I think Albert Einstein said that, but, but before I started reading this, I think I'd like to get into your world. 
I take care of the development and take care of this whole policy and 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 uh, I a lot of met a lot of people that think they're doing everything right and I'm, what I'm saying very simply is that if we're doing everything uh, right where are the results in the field because since I have to operate we're all talking about look, you know, seeking out methods we're getting better at the but at the end of it we have to deliver a lot of people were, were convinced the bankers were convinced the development people were convinced they'd understood the whole thing and when i went to the field i could see the opposite of that so why am i telling you this i'm sorry for being how can i put this <laughs> to be uh, to being too close to the truth it's not very politically correct perhaps but but i'm saying this because i have the feeling and that's why i'm here i'm not here because you need somebody to come to speak to you i came here today to say that i have the feeling before starting to work in the government that there were many people from the world bank in my office in brussels they were talking to me about a new fund and every time there's a problem there's a new fund so they came to talk to me about the fif the the, the fund for health it's a topic that i'm aware of because a co-chief of, of Covax. so why do you have to do something new seeing so in europe we do so much already about that and, you know, we, we did the Covax. nobody answered me in Washington. I said, we have to go there. So I was in head of this now with the DGM and with everybody from finance. And I was happy because I understood that being a doctor or a surgeon is useful. Also, in case of listening, saying, you know, how are we going to deal with this? How do we treat this? So that's why at the beginning I was talking with the president and saying that we have a problem uh, other than the billions and six billion for the climate, five billion for adaptation. But people say, we don't believe you anymore. So with the president who spoke to the UN that we should avoid fractures between the North and the South. So after many discussions, I think ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, uh, dear Patrick, who invited me, I think that this announcement that the president made for these big international meetings, we cannot miss them. It's a, it's a hinging point. On the one hand, the last year after COVID, we struck off six years of progress in terms of our sustainable development objectives. And, and then climate change and, by, and loss of biodiversity is already affecting dramatically the populations of the most vulnerable countries. You can see flooding, we see uh, cyclones, we see uh, drought in Africa. We cannot have economic development in a world that is threatened by a climate dysregulation. And lastly, very important is the Russian aggression against Ukraine has brought about inflation, the food crisis, energy crisis, which touch in a disproportionate fashion uh, countries in the South. So this crisis has increased inequalities and injustice. And there is a speech, uh, you know, for people that are traveling. I think almost everybody in this room travels and knows the world quite well. We see they're very close to that fracture, north and south. And, and we have to assume that, and that's kind of scary. Because we see that we've reached our limits and, and discourse is not enough. Talking is not enough. And this architecture that we've spoken about and decided on in the 40s is no longer adapted. It to, it's no, no longer responds to the challenges of the 20th century. We have to start doing things uh, for real. 
we cannot respond to everything. We cannot respond quickly. We cannot be agile. It's a system that is slow, extremely slow, except that the time now, we can't run. We have to be, we have, the tools have to be adapted and ready for response. As I was saying, what do you remember out the, of the, about the, the COP? We talked about mitigation or attenuation to five degrees. We're talking about that again? In other words, for me, we're not dealing with the cause. We're going to treat the symptoms. So we're going to give them a paracetamol. We're going to be happy. No, I mean, the, the patient is ill. We have to do something about it. And the other thing that I see as well in this summit is that we have a window of opportunity, a single, uh, a one and only unique opportunity. So this is from the 20, uh, this is, we're halfway to 2030, to 2030 agenda. So we're going to assess that. And the United States as a shareholder is a very center of the system. They're not, they're about to enter into a new electoral cycle in 2024. The discussions about reforming the World Bank or the IMF is progressing rapidly. We have, we have, there's soon going to be a world new president of the World Bank, which could be an opportunity. And also the presidency in India is uh, up for grabs. And subsequently, there's a preparation for a, a Brazilian presidential election for the year following that. So you can see, we can see that the stars are well aligned. So we need to have some clear objectives, and I can identify three of those. We have to finish the, the progress that the international community initiated uh, during the pandemic. That is the reallocation uh, of DS. We've everyone has understood. We need to reallocate. The President of the Republic made commitments. We're moving from 20% to 30% of reallocated funds. And as you said, both of you, this is the question of the debt. I talked about the third the third time I spoke was the, was the President of Zambia. This was an example where the indebted countries that are seriously indebted there is a framework and Ghana as well. And we're talking about who's going to be the next. So, so this is a very, uh, this is a source of concern. And since I was born in Greece, you know what happened in Greece in terms of the debt and what that has cost of a, to that country. So I'm very sensitive to the whole question of debt. The second objective is to accelerate the ongoing dynamics. And I'm thinking about the changes in the World Bank. And I think that during the spring meetings, we're going to be talking about that. And the third thing is that we need to think more deeply and ambitiously about public uh, goods worldwide in terms of the climate vulnerability and the perspectives of uh, and the, also the issues involved in the COP28. So how are we going to do that? What are the, what's the method that we're going to be doing? Philippe, you spoke about a Macron uh, summit. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it that. I wouldn't call it that. Why? I would say the President of the Republic is a multilateral person, and he would like for Paris to be a multilateral city. Having worked at the World Bank, I understand that there's going to be an increase in the number of people who are going to be working. And in this particular case, 
I think for the uh, French Development Bank, the AFT, a, a, develop, a national development bank to see how the World Bank, how can the NGOs and how can all those things work together. But in addition to that, what I say is that this is an opportunity and that's what the president said Friday. He met with the prime minister of Barbados, Mia Motley. And as you know, with his Bridgestone agenda and the various proposals involved in that. So we, we can see, and that's what Mr. President would like for Paris to be the multilateral city and to keep that alive. So there's no longer the banking and people in development with the second category. It's not just Washington and New York are together. The little islands are there as well. The African continent is there as well. The state, public and private stakeholders are together. Philanthropists and associations are there. And obviously, all of the think tanks and the university people are there. So this is a, an inclusive think tank. And at the same time, it's effective. So we have all of the energies. We can no longer accept. And I'm sure you think the same thing. We can no longer accept that we have all of the brains that we have. We have the funding. Now we need courage. So this work of consultation that we did with the president a long time ago, Miyamoto was there. There were uh, information I had. I went to Stockholm, where we had an interministerial meeting from development ministers. And this was very interesting in a European level. There are 27 of us. So it's important to see that this shared a vision. And they were surprised about how interested people were and about a position between the Gentiloni and Upilain. And this is something that Jorge Borrell said. He said, all of my life, we used to say, bank of development, bank, bank, or development. He said, with Paris, we have the possibility of uniting those two things. So there we are. I think that the idea is to have the partner, the partner Brazil, Barbados, United Nations, Washington. There's a lot of expectations there. And I think that here, I have in front of me I have a team from France, and I think we need, the President of the Republic needs to have your ideas. And I'm very happy about all of the uh, your discussions that you're going to be having, and it's important. And you have the International Architecture of fun Funding and Development, the FERDI, as part and parcel of that, you have a very important role to play. You've been a partner for a long time with the, of the ministry. And they think that this cycle of conferences, you need to take you have to, to, to go for it. You can't be conservative this time. You can be conservative, but you're going to have a revolution everywhere because injustice is starting to, uh, to rise and further and further. And it's very important that this time we have to have the courage to move forward. And to conclude, I wanted to say Dear Patrick, first of all, to thank you and say that the idea of vulnerability is at the heart of what you do and has been for many years. And it's true at the heart of this summit, in the summit in June, as we had discussed in Doran. So I'd like to wish you a, a good, good, do some good work. I'm very happy to be part of this family because I feel that I am part of my family if you're willing to have me. I also see Daniel Cohen, I see Oxfam, Oxfam, one, people from the treasury, from development. There's a, some great energy. We don't have much time. We only have three months. So let's get to work and, and good courage to us all. Thank you.
Please make sure you speak into microphones. It's very important. Uh, just uh, as uh, the Secretary of State uh, has done, uh, we're uh, fortunate enough to have uh, 300 people uh, attending uh, this uh, conference mm -hmm. online. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Jean-Michel Severino. I'm uh, the senior, senior, senior fellow of uh, the FERDI. My warmest thanks uh, to the minister, to Philip and Patrick, for launching this cycle uh, and uh, to start it uh, logically, we're going to be looking first at uh, the purposes. Madam Minister, you said that uh, you were discussing with uh, Philip, uh, uh, you were discussing uh, about uh, this new architecture. You said, uh, how would we design the Bretton Woods system if we were not to 1943? You're absolutely right, but why should we do that? Now, of course, uh, this is going to be extremely theoretical it's probably the the moment or the part of the cycle where we might uh, stray most away uh, from immediate and, and practical issues. I think uh, we need to, to accept uh, that uh, we might uh, take some distance from practical issues, but temporarily. Now, something is going to compensate this uh, purely theoretical aspect. We have people who are deeply involved in uh, development. Uh, day-to-day -day lives of countries and operations. Of course, uh, uh, Madam Minister Niali Kaba, the Minister of Planning and Development of the Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, but also Mr. Tertius Songo, who will be addressing us online, who's the former Prime Minister of Burkina Faso, and who's the Director of the Sahel Chair of the FERDI. He will be also accompanied by Bertrand Baconer, the Deputy Direct Chief Executive of the AFT, the French Development Agency, who is going to replace Remy Ryu at the last minute. Uh, Remy, Ryu, Remy Ryu had last last minute engagement. Uh, we also have a, a major partner represented by Maria del Pilar Garrigo Gonzalo, who is uh, the Director of uh, the Development Cooperation Directorate, the DCD at the OECD. And actually, we'll be going to be talking quite a lot about what you do. We'll be talking about metrics, the uh, the Directorate of uh, Development uh, at uh, the OECD is really a master in uh, metrics. We'll also be joined by Pierre Jacquet, who used to be the economist of the AFD and who used to be the president of the Global Development Network, the GDN, and will also be joined. Uh, well, we have, I think, a representative of uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations. I, I think this participant will be online. Patrick, I'm looking at you. I don't know. We, we haven't got any confirmation yet. And uh, I will be facilitating this panel discussion with Sylviane uh, guillemont genenet who's uh, drafted a paper that will be really the, the springboard uh, for this uh, discussion, which I hope will be very entertaining and very original. Now, we won't have a lot of time. Uh, each participant will have about uh, five to six minutes. This is going to be the, the main ops, the main difficulty, and I, I feel a bit guilty because because unfortunately I have to make opening remarks. So I'm going to use uh, five to six minutes of this floor time if my fellow panelists accept. Now, current uh, development financing started in, in in 1945, and of course there was a real surge when countries exceeded in independence, and it's kept improving. I think we can say that. Uh, uh, public uh, development aid, uh, official development aid, has uh, uh, kept in increasing uh, over time. Uh, so today we're on the region of $180 billion in terms of financing. And each well, countries have contributed differently. Some have contributed more than others at uh, different times. Others have uh, scaled down their contributions, uh, but overall flows have kept increasing. This quantitative growth uh, also uh, diversified a great deal over time. The diversification of players, uh, a more complex uh, relation uh, relationship between bilateral and multilateral uh, financing, the uh, the entry of NGOs into this realm, and also private players. And as I was saying, it's a very complex environment, which is partially due partially linked with globalization and the emergence of uh, new players over the decades and this is becoming in increasingly even more difficult today with geopolitical tensions uh, which uh, make it more difficult uh, to strike uh, consensuses uh, it makes uh, exchanges less smooth as the minister said 
Now, it's not all doom and gloom, uh, uh, but uh, somehow there's a sense of chaos, of misunderstanding, that it's uh, difficult to uh, understand and get to grips uh, with uh, this uh, development uh, uh, sector. And it also raises issues about so the costs of financing, the cost of functioning of the operating cost of the system, but also uh, rules in the field. And also it's difficult for uh, recipient countries, uh, uh, it's difficult for them to know who to turn to, and it's difficult to know how to make things harmonious in the field. So the purpose of, of our paper is as follows. Uh, we're not saying that we should replace the system, but uh, that uh, we've seen that uh, there's the, the superimposition, the coexistence of uh, different rationales uh, with uh, different uh, philosophical or th even theological approaches. So philosophical, we have uh, Kant, Bentham and, and Rawls. Kant is the categorical, categorical imperative of justice and solidarity, the, the need to uh, support or to assist uh, uh, the the poorest and also the need to do unto others what you'd like to be done unto bentham it's more utilitarian somehow it's uh, it's the the issue of uh, public global global public goods i have contributed uh, uh, i've used up uh, uh, carbon uh, emission schemes so well i've created an, an external IT. i'll pay for it so we have a, a benthamian uh, world uh, that's all part of uh, the sector which has emerged and there's a third pillar based on rules or russo it's uh, the global social compact a common society and the rules of justice that have to apply to transfers to relations to interpersonal relations so when we put our heads together with Sylvian and thought about these different uh, moral and philosophical categories, we actually realized that they trickled down into three categories of job objectives that were intertwined in the field. The objective to ensure the convergence of incomes between countries, which is the uh, oldest objective of uh, development, but which, which remains and uh, more than ever, because uh, in the last uh, 50 years, uh, part uh, of uh, the development uh, world has been uh, quite uh, has been uh, on the way up basically part of asia and another part of the world has uh, plateaued and this is uh, a fundamental aspect of justice so we have a global market but one of the imp impacts we can expect uh, well, it would be the convergence of incomes and so somehow paradoxically this could be a rolling issue also there's the issue of a minimum solidarity a foundation of solidarity we know that some countries uh, despite their efforts will remain out of uh, global growth similarly uh, in our national communities in a country like france there are regions that uh, are that have to overcome problems that are extremely difficult and in some communities uh, between communities there are some transfer dynamics and of course this whole issue of uh, relief or humanitarian aid and natural disasters uh, that are also an important part of financing. Last, there's the issue of uh, public goods, uh, which are extremely diverse. You cannot uh, address uh, the biodiversity, climate, uh, uh, vaccination, public goods, or even the public goods of financial stability without addressing this. Uh, these are topics with uh, different kinds of externalities and uh, which raise different issues in terms of financing and allocation. Now, what's striking here is that uh, the current uh, metric, and I, this is not, uh, we're not criticizing here the uh, quote unquote old metric of uh, the, the OECD metric of ODA, but uh, our current uh, metric of ODA does not capture the diversity of these flows. We have a metric which has one merit, it's a consensual, it's very well organized, it's uh, quite legitimate, and uh, countries really tend to uh, report, so it has a lot of merits. It's an, this institutional metric, but actually it describes uh, uh, flows depending on geographical areas uh, uh, and uh, on, uh, on creditors, but with this system, we cannot measure the following things. We cannot measure the convergence of incomes. We don't know what is channeled in solidarity and what, what is channeled into common public goods. These aspects are not taken into account in this system. 
And because of that, because we don't know uh, what the ultimate purpose of uh, flows is, well, it's very difficult to assess their effectiveness. And indeed, it's very difficult to understand the dynamics. So in our paper, we uh, propose not to replace uh, the current ODA metric, but to add a complementary counting system to measure the purposes of flows. So the flows from different players, public uh, uh, players, governments, private sectors, uh, the private players, uh, philanthropic organizations that could uh, report their uh, financing using this. But also we should take into account an important aspect. That's what we could uh, call the uh, issue of double, triple dividends or benefits. It hasn't escaped anyone's notice that it's very difficult to uh, differentiate between a strictly public and strictly private flows, something that uh, Philip likes to talk about, for example. Say you finance a green power plant in a developing country. Is this, a, is this climate finance or is this growth finance? So the confusing answer is all these dimensions together. So you need to be able at, at some point that you actually finance the two or the three dimensions. So we need to have reporting systems that can uh, reflect this. But sometimes you only do one thing. For example, if you finance in a country the replacement of a thermal production unit, of a carbon uh, intensive thermal unit with a green replacement unit, you do not build capacity, you don't finance growth, you it's it's climate finance. So but there will be only one thing being reported. So we can see here that we have many different things, and that's the main idea of this paper. We need to reinvent the metric system. I'm coming to the end of the, these opening remarks. I don't think it's uh, it has escaped anyone's notice that uh, creating new metrics or uh, introducing additional metrics will not uh, do away with uh, um, confusion and uh, overlaps, duplicates in the, in the system, but it will allow us to better understand what we do and therefore allow us to better analyze things and make more relevant proposals, but also to self-assess, depending on what we want to achieve. And this is particularly important. And I'd like to wrap up with this to, to start the debate. One of the complexities uh, of that, that we uh, are dealing with at the moment is that depending on the different types of objectives, income convergence, solidarity, global public goods, Depending on the objective, the rationales, the principles are different in the in financing and allocation. If we want to finance so the reduction of CO2 emissions, for example, on the planet, it would make sense to say that it's uh, countries that uh, have been the largest emitters that uh, would have the main financial burden to the benefit of countries that emit very few emissions. Let me give you an example. For example, we could say, right, uh, it's fair to say that China is increasingly contributing in terms of flows, but China is not to be blamed. Is not we, we cannot blame China for the stock. Now, however, if you want to finance income convergence, there's no reason why uh, a major middle-income country that has reached very high GDP levels shouldn't contribute and recipient countries will be different for example in the first scenario if we want to finance climate there's no reason to uh, rule out from recipients uh, uh, middle or low-income countries that could be small contributors however if you want to finance solidarity yes we need to exclude them so we can see that there are different categories that uh, call for different uh, financing, and distribution, and allocation rationales. And that's why it's it's interesting to use this kind of metrics to address these issues. So, uh, and, for, and unfortunately, today's metric of OTA does not allow us to do that. I'm done. Uh, Sylvian, would you like to, to take the floor now, or do you want to answer questions? Yes, if, if, if you don't mind. I just would like to add something. Jean-Michel has just advocating advocated a sort of mapping, and it's important 
because even though there might be overlaps between the different purposes, there are distinct objectives and there are very important trade-offs. And today, there's a very important question. What's the most important? Is it income convergence? It is solidarity. And there's a trend at the moment in favor of solidarity because there are some emergencies and public policies usually tend to favor the short term rather than the long term. And also there's a very important trade-off between country development, whether the development of the productive sector or social sectors that can drive developments such as education and health and public goods, because even though there are overlaps, they're not the same. There are lots of activities that uh, have to be promoted because they will, they will drive growth, especially in uh, fast growing in, country, in countries with, with fast growing demographics, but it's not really related to climate. Now, I think that one of the main advantages of uh, this uh, clear mapping is that it, it allows you to uh, do some trade-offs, or I have to, at least to, be, to have a good knowledge of these. Well, thank you very much, Sylvian. Right. This was extremely useful. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over straight to the minister, Madam Minister, who's going to set the ball rolling for this panel discussion. I do hope that we'll manage to uh, keep to our allotted floor time so our colleagues uh, in, uh, in the room can uh, ask questions. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of the conference for the honor of uh, inviting us to participate in this uh, high level meeting. And I'd like to thank you for the uh, quality of the support you're providing, supporting worldwide policy, and to, and to congratulate those responsible for that. It's a very rich report about the problem of, uh, of financing development. I'd like to take advantage of my turn to make a few comments. I think the essential parts will be about come out of the discussion. My first comment is quite clear. The purpose of development financing is convergence of revenue on the basis of solidarity and the management of public goods. And what I've understood is that these purposes are, are unique in time. These are questions of dosing and proportion of importance that is granted them, depending on the period and the geopolitical the situations and considerations. And today, in funding of development, we the prominent uh, importance of the climate, which is becoming today a major criteria. Uh, most aid, aid has a tendency to be aligned on worldwide concerns having to do with the environment. And it is about this question I would like to, to speak about in, in my talk today. We're in a worldwide uh, crisis, context of crisis, having to do with the conditions of funding our economies, whereas our countries are ch are challenged with many types of challenges that go way beyond just climate change. As Madam said, we have developed. We have to finance the development of our production sectors. We have to finance growth. Within that, we have the concern of the food safety, which all countries have, which have been added to the world crisis. We have to digitize our economies in these production tools, but we also need to continue to fund social sectors. Our youth is a very strong and vibrant sector. They have a lot of expectations. They have to be educated and trained and be cared for. We also have to watch uh, the safety of our governments. 
and, and to all of this, we need to add environment and climate change. I heard earlier people talking about sustainable development objectives. I think it's the world agenda since 2015. The agenda has not changed when you look at the priorities of the worldwide agenda. These 17 objectives, the environment is number 13 of, out of those objectives. After the fight against poverty and, and, and uh, hunger and health, after uh, nutrition. And I don't, I haven't yet, we haven't reached even the first objectives. We have not seen any major specific changes which would justify a see, a, 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 a such a change in the order of priorities. I think that worldwide, this is something that needs to be included in the actual definition of objectives and the purposes of uh, allocating assistance. One other point that I would like to mention, which was said as well, the idea of fragmentation and dispersion of uh, interventions, perhaps worldwide, we should have a better uh, consultation, or even within our governments. We all want to have a kind of a dialogue amongst uh, philanthropists so that we can coordinate our interventions better, so that we're not uh, overlapping or interfering with each other. We, we want to have an appropriate impact in public interventions. The whole question of vulnerability is of great importance. And I hope we're going to be dealing with that uh, finely tuned in this series of speeches because a country such as Cote d'Ivoire is penalized about the question of vulnerability. But in reality, with the security environment that, that's around us, we have a kind of vulnerability which doesn't depend on us because we have our neighbors that are showing up and they're applying pressure on our infrastructures, our schools. We have to house people. They're in the outlying areas which bring insecurity into the cities. And all of this is not included when you take indicators about the Côte world to be able to place that as a function of the aid they're receiving. So the criteria of vulnerability can be uh, a, a, a good indicators to make sure that the final purpose of the aid is being reached. And to conclude, just a couple of suggestions. The first would be to listen better to people, the countries benefiting from public financing of development to take into account their own priorities better and to uh, really to fight. And I may have heard that, but about a reform of the financial architecture worldwide to have a better representative representativity for uh, goods of, for development and to adopt more voluntary approaches to support the dynamics in industrialization and, and, and change in our countries. And for that to happen, it's important to add to what we're already being done with strategies based on interventions in the private sectors, in particular to reinforce co-development strategies, joint ventures, any strategy encouraging the blossoming of the private sector, local, to make it strong and dynamic that will support local, local uh, SMBs so that they can support our development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. And then the points you raised, the question of associations of in, uh, involving everyone in policy. If we, if we don't have common metrics, uh, the, if it's a, it's a participative governance is a very important thing. We need to continue with Tercius Zongo, but I don't know if he's connected. Uh, I'm connected. Fantastic. You were being very discreet, Tercius. Oh, we can see you. Okay. Welcome, sir. I would like to hand over the floor to you. We're so happy to have a presentation later. Thank you very much, Jean-Michel.
thanks to all of the participants. Two things. I think that the minister nearly cover raised a certain number of points that I don't that I share fully that I don't need to go over again. I'm going to perhaps make some comments rather of a different type. And I hope that with our experience and the things that can be useful. The basic report is well oriented. It does contribute more clarity when we talk about public assistance for development, or even up until now, the question of justification, you know, why why do we need aid? Doesn't seem to be very clear. If we are led to discuss these issues, there's a whole why to this. Since 45, aid has been growing, has become diversified, the flows were important, but the results are there, we observe. There was a small part of the world which is doing better, but for most of the regions, the concerns are quite, uh, you know, deep, deeply eroded. So, so for me, these are problems that are uh, abnormal. Jean-Michel said it. The first problem to, is that of analysis. It's a problem of analysis because until now, you cannot assess something that all of the stakeholders have not analyzed and understood where they're going. And the real problem of aid is that initially, what's the analysis that's being done? Who did it? Who's reaching conclusions? You have to have responses to the types of responses and who's responsible that the response be sustainable. How do you assess? For me, I've observed aid for a long time, and that is the basic problem. Thank goodness um, that since the various reports were published and the failed report has come out, we see the way how important and there is a real need to have these analyses done in beneficiary companies. They can be accompanied, but so long as we haven't resolved the problem of analysis, it's not the part that's conducting analyze. It's, there are people that, are, that actually live in the situation and who know the mentality, who know the sociology, who can provide uh, responses. And I think that so long as we don't deal with this problem, the fundamental question that Jean-Michel raised is the question of assessment. The problem of public aid to development is you'll have the key that will satisfy everyone when, when we've started insisting on the impact. What is coming out of this? And so that we know what is coming out of this is positive. You have to, this aid has to either by people, this is we th what we think we want. This is what we feel to be necessary. That's an, in this, a, a very good indication. There are some modifications we saw, there are, there are a few, but the real question is the same. And we have to try to confront it. And the second point, which is an important point, as Jean-Michel underlined, there's a lot of discussion has been made about this. We need to look at this, and that is the whole story of arbitration, which was properly raised. How are we going to arbitrate between convergence, create potentials, because whatever you say about it, and we need to move towards a, 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 a well-being that's immediate. There are two oppositions here that seem to be oppositions, but we need to be handled because the partners aren't going to deal with these two issues. It's not possible. There are people that are work on urgent matters, that only see urgent matters. But how do you deal with urgent matters all the, over the long haul? That's not always a concern, whereas you need to solve this question. And I think that the report has given a, a, an orientation that I share fully. It is very clear that, yes, so useful solidarity and the short-term problem is useful certainly to give a certain impetus 
and the desire to fight by the population to give them hope again. But that is, but what will that become tomorrow? That's why I share the concern in the report that was expressed that those that get into creating growth and creating wealth needs to bring a fundamental element, which is never taken into account in discussions, i.e. no country can be developed on resources that are being given to them. The resources are there to accompany, they create conditions, but ultimately the country needs to be capable of generating the resources that will enable them to orientate their own development. And that is really, how can I put this? And that is the convergence that makes it possible to create those conditions where the country invests over the long haul or the, themselves feel that they're responsible for what they're doing and are willing to finance. And the second point that was raised, and I think it's an important point, is everything having to do with human resources, education, with health system, the sanitary system. The question is, yes, we need to train people. But if you don't create the, the conditions to create wealth, where you have an interior market that frightens people, or you can generate resources, local resources that make it possible to continue to invest to, and to cover the expenses of those investments. You're going to be wide. If we can't do that, we're going to end up staying where we are. As Madame Yale said, the question about the question of vulnerability, we need to study those indeed to see what points we need to reinforce and to, we need to advance in. I, I think I'll stop at this point because I had five minutes. But in terms of the Sahel region, you dealt with it. If you take that area today, I don't see an intervention on the part of a partner that cannot be wondering how to rethink the contribution of development to security and to stability, not of a country, but of a region. Sometimes you need to look at the regional framework because the regional, you can't have a strong region with a weak country. I understand. But today, in what way, if you take the Sahel area, in what way will the development going to implement make it possible to provide security and stability naturally? We're going to be coming up with various classifications that you made, which are right, this convergence, and solidarity, and public goods. And I'd like to conclude with a, with a question that uh, Mrs. Yumu enjoys. It's the metrics. It's all about the metrics that Jean-Michel was speaking about as well. When today you look in Burkina, France has given so much in countries that, that aren't in there. You propose to enlarge this action. But I think that above and beyond the approach, we have to reinforce the ability of countries to have a constructive dialogue where they know what they had got, what they did with it, and what 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 did it give. It's not, it's not something based in, in Brussels. Yeah, it's a good thing to know, but if Burkina is not able to transform that, and you know, say I received so much from the World Bank, we'll be swimming around vaguely and not re really knowing. If you make the decisions for the future, but we don't have the information necessary the, to guide that decision. I think uh, with the discussions, doubtless, we'll have a certain number of, how can I put this? There are a lot of practical points uh, on part of the person receiving the money, how they are, assess the situation and what can be a consensus that might make it possible to be serene about it. A few points I wanted to raise, Jean-Michel. As Madame Bailey said, and technically, what I wanted to say as well. But I made some comments that are more of a general sense. Thank you for this vision. Thank you, Tersh. It's, uh, it's a very refreshing look at things. Um, well, uh, it now falls uh, upon you to uh, 
follow up on this well um, thank you very much i think the mic is working good afternoon everybody thank you very much uh, for inviting me to take part uh, in this brainstorming session this afternoon so um first of all the afd has produced uh, this year a document entitled uh, uh, public uh, official development aid the age of consequences and following the intervention of the minister and the prime minister and considering the content of uh, the paper written by Jean-Michel and Sylviane uh, there's a there's a number of things that uh, I think we've already observed at first hand in our work uh, and uh, which uh, uh, reflect uh, your analysis now why did we write this paper ODA the age of consequences well the fact is that uh, the concept of ODA is being criticized today some states uh, call us out and say we don't want help from uh, countries of the north we want investments irrespective of their nature so uh, it's all about uh, well we've been looking for semantics and then concepts related to solidarity investments but anyway uh, oda is being disputed the concept itself is being disputed that's the first point second uh, this uh, concept of aid is also being challenged, uh, as uh, Jean-Michel said. The original objective was to, to grant 0.7%. Uh, the, that's the much uh, uh, talked about uh, ratio of uh, aid to uh, GDP, gross GDP ratio. We can see there was uh, a major increase in the first years after uh, ODA was increased. Then uh, there was the so-called uh, uh, aid fatigue period, but then a resumption, uh, a revival of uh, public aid, uh, of official aid mobilized by North countries uh, uh, with a view to the fight against climate change. Uh, uh, climate is becoming a very important uh, global public, public good. This has led to the superimposition of many important objectives, the protection of global public goods on the one hand, and the fight against poverty on the other hand. So this development policy is being challenged, disputed, but uh, we also came to the conclusion that it is a very powerful policy at global level because uh, it, it uh, really mobilizes a lot of support and also because there are standards well the oecd uh, is not represented here to my left uh, is its custodian there's an accountability framework but also this policy is the possibility for recipient countries to uh, discuss the contribution of uh, states that uh, have uh, undertaken to mobilize part of their public resources. So um, what we've tried to achieve, and I think it's quite consistent with uh, what you have sought to do, uh, Jean-Michel and Sylvain, we've tried to reconcile the advantages of uh, this global policy, which actually is probably the only global policy today with an accountability, accountability framework, with metrics, uh, uh, and standards uh, that are imperfect, but that do exist, they're there. But as we've said, uh, there's a confusion of objectives, uh, the, the objectives of the fight against poverty and, 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 and against climate change, but also the emergence of uh, new issues. And, uh, well, uh, um, large emitters will have to contribute uh, to the environmental uh, trajectory or path of countries that emit less CO2. Now, this is something quite new. Well, it's not entirely new, but uh, uh, it's really entered uh, the international community debate quite recently, and uh, it's not been yet fully taken into account in ODA's objectives. The last thing that uh, really strikes us in our day-to-day -day work is uh, about involvement of mobilization. Today, as a public development bank, uh, uh, we are required by French authorities uh, to set our sights on uh, rationales and uh, tools that will contribute to French public uh, development objectives. And uh, our belief is that uh, public and private players, development uh, banks, uh, should be able uh, to uh, be involved uh, in, uh, or should, should contribute to the development paths of countries, not only South countries. And unfortunately, ODA objectives do not entirely take into account this objective. And, uh, in our day-to-day -day roadmaps, we don't have this, this objective of securing, for example, private funds, not only private funds, but this would be an objective. That is why we've worked on these issues. And also, 
our findings, and it's only a proposal really, but our findings are slightly different uh, uh, from uh, the three objectives of uh, income convergence, solidarity, and global public goods. They're slightly different, but not incompatible. Now we, um, we stick to the scope of uh, the fight against poverty for poor countries, for the poorest countries, and another scope uh, for countries that are large emitters, uh, analyses that show that uh, uh, it's uh, where there's most at stake in terms of the protection of global public goods and also to uh, decarbonize their economies. We believe this is a very important objective, clarifying the allocation of uh, public resources between states uh, with view to these two objectives, the protection of go global public goods on the one hand and the fight against poverty on the other hand. And it's actually quite consistent with the 4th of August 2021 bill or act that was unanimously passed in the French Parliament. If you look at uh, current uh, debates in the French Parliament, uh, you can say that already at the time it was quite uh, a feat. So we have these two priorities, the fight against poverty and global public goods, and that's really uh, the, the basis of our thinking today. And we also have a third pillar. Uh, the, the 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 fight against the vulnerability of states to climate change, which is slightly different from the protection of global public goods. So, how can the new schemes, for example, insurance schemes or other instruments, how can they help us tackle these very specific situations? Maybe one last comment uh, to contribute to, to today's debate. Sylviane, uh, Jean-Michel, uh, in your paper and, and also in the contributions of both ministers, uh, I've uh, heard what you said about the about development trajectories. And I think we need to connect this to the emergency of, uh, in, of health and education, education related issues. So how can you reconcile a long term vision with short term objectives? This is something that we're really trying to capture with our metrics and uh, reforming uh, objectives uh, for uh, ODA. Also, we, we've made a proposal on this. And when you start discussing uh, development paths or trajectories, and actually we're starting to discuss this with some partner states about this. Well, our partners actually ask us about our own path, about our own trajectory. So they ask us, for example, about our healthcare sector or about transport, and they ask us how we deliver on our goals and how this contributes to decarbonizing our economy, uh, how does it contribute to improving gender equality, um, things that are uh, described uh, as global public goods, and also uh, we have uh, the classical priorities or standard priorities such as uh, biodiversity, but for example, uh, gender equality and uh, uh, gender pay equality should also uh, taken on board in this thinking process. So this idea of the, the, the trajectory, the path, is a very important element of what we try to, to capture. Last, uh, I'm, I'm going to finish in a minute. Um, as regards the metrics of uh, ODA going forward, well, these metrics should really attract the private sector we should really try and take or onboard the private sector. And we need to find objectives that will be consistent uh, or common for, between the private and the public sector if we want to work on development and shared prosperity for uh, countries of the South. Thank you. Thank you, Bertrand, for this uh, very rich intervention. Uh, and actually, uh, I'd like to pay tribute to, to this paper uh, drafted by uh, uh, different uh, authors, uh, which is really good. I would really urge participants to read it. Now, I'm uh, delighted to hand over to Maria del Pilar Garrido Gonzalo. Uh, the OECD has been uh, mentioned uh, many times already. As I was saying in my opening remarks, uh, uh, the, the uh, DCD is really the uh, directorate that measure ODA. So the OECD has been at the heart of uh, today's discussion. Yes, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to be speaking English, but I know we've got uh, interpreters uh, if you need. Uh, so first, thank you very much to Cody and the Minister of Europe and Foreign Affairs for this very kind invitation.
thank you also for sharing this very provoking paper and on the purpose of age and allowing me to briefly react to it. So yes, we are facing a wall of trillions. We need four trillions uh, of annual investment in developing countries for SDGs, one trillion for the climate agenda, half a trillion for the reconstruction of Ukraine, and the list goes on. If you then turn to ODA, you will finally uh, understand that with 200 billion uh, uh, dollars, actually is 185.9 billions in 2021, or even 400 or 600 if donors were to reach 0.5 or 0.7 of their GNI and aid allocation, you're setting yourself up for a disappointment or a discouraging. OGA cannot do it all. Uh, while we continuously advocate for OGA to keep on growing with our uh, DAC members and our DAC delegates, we also need to strategize about how we can make it uh, the use of it hand in hand to make the most of it. In that sense, climate and global public goods agendas are added to the more traditional uh, economic and solidarity objectives of public financing for development in the background note are both a blessing and a curse for OGA. A blessing because finally, for the first time, OGA OGA is not seen as a cost, but it is actually seen as an investment, with the returns for both the recipient and the donor at the same time as for the planet and the people more broadly. Even the private sector now sees some interest in commingling with the development community cooperation community through blending finance or other methods, because a better management of global public goods is necessary to preserve the medium to longer value of their economic and financial assets. Of course, also, because uh, it is tempting to concentrate efforts where, where returns are highest for the donors and lose sight of other priorities of partner developing countries. For example, when we think about uh, mitigation over adaptation and we think about green transitioning without making it just a just green transition. The background note uh, rightly stresses the risk associated with trade-offs and diversion. The recent edition of our flagship, the Global Economic uh, Outlook on Financing for Sustainable Development, stresses that there can be no sustainability without equity. The report also shows that the sustainable finance boom has not benefited all countries, but rather generated a, a risk of wider divide. Financing gaps are missed investment opportunities from a sustainable development perspective that would require new risk assessment and management approaches. There are three layers in the system that could be shifted to finance. The most present sustainable development finance needs. For example, global government revenues exceeded 22 trillion USD. Same for domestic private investment. Global exports represent 28 trillion US dollars. Foreign direct investment, 2 trillion US dollars. Global finance financial assets under management more than $469 trillion. ODA is a small but important piece of the global financing for sustainable architecture. It is stable and predictable. It has proven to play a role in terms of counter cyclical uh, in times of crisis, and it remains the predominant source of financing in the most vulnerable countries. Filling in the SDGs gap or the climate transition financial gap is not an should be, and it shouldn't be, the sole objective of ODA. However, ODA should play a role as in a catalyst or an enabler and help mobilize and better align all domestic and external public and private sources of financing with sustainable development objectives. ODA is also more than money. It is also about policy and it is also about policy coherence. It is about how to bring much more than sustainable development than just finance. For example, in the case of green transition, development cooperation has a very important role to play, not only to finance infrastructure, but also to support the emergency of new preferences, the design of national transition strategies, the trajectories that we have been speaking about, uh, and the reform of policies and the deepening of markets to the most uh, of green growth. So as it has been mentioned in this panel, effectiveness and the policy coherence matters and matters more than ever. Since we first initiated our work with SDG alignment and finance with the Ministry of Foreign and uh, Europe and Foreign Affairs during the French presidency of the G7 in 2019, 
we have been trying to align better actors uh, along the investment chain behind financing sustainable development in developing countries. This includes coherence of policies in OECD countries with the advocacy against misaligned subsidies. For instance, global fossil fuel consumption subsidies doubled from the previous year to all time high of 1 trillion in 2022. We also need to ensure coherence of policies for intermediary actors, promoting responsible business conduct and qualities of trade and foreign investment, because sometimes what we do at the ministries uh, is then uh, erased or undermined by some other um, local or global action of enterprises. Uh, and we need coherence of development cooperation itself, the DAC declaration on the alignment with the Paris Agreement and the removal of bottlenecks to access to sustainable financing partner countries are examples of such efforts. Going forward, the OECD will continue to support and actively engage in the preparation of the John Summit and beyond, including the revision of the Addis Ababa action in 2025. We are working on concrete deliverables. For example, we are developing an analytical tool to compare portfolios of multilateral and bilateral financiers with a view to address fragmentation, which has been uh, largely spoken about at this panel, and uh, the lack of accountability of the system. And we're also developing developing along with UNDP and UNDESA, a pool uh, mechanism to match the financing expertise of our members with the needs of developing countries for advice on how to access finance. You can count on OECD and I look forward to continuing deepening uh, further our collaboration with France and making OGA count, not to solve all the issues, but help leverage sources uh, of financing and policies for greater coherent, sustainable development impact. Um, C'est tout, merci. <laughs> Merci d'avoir également. Thank you for having talked about the modesty of this, the small amount that this is seen from a worldwide point of view, but it's also very important. It's one of the dimensions that really situates what we're talking about today, and uh, which makes the OECD as necessary as ever. Pierre, it's your turn. Thank you, Jean-Michel. I'd like uh, to join my voice to all of those who saluted the importance and the relevance of this paper. It is fundamental to wonder and what development, what is the reason there is on debt? I think this paper provides some very important responses. And I think a couple of comments to get back to the mapping you're proposing about convergence and solidarity world public goods. I just approach this a bit differently. I think this policy, which was said by several people, it's the beginning of a global uh, economy without a government decentralized. And to deal with the whole uh, reason for being, you can ask the same question that was economists were wanting about the reason for being the public uh, uh, goods. There's an article written in the 80s by Robert and Peggy, and Peggy Musgrave. That the, the financial uh, involvement has three purposes allocating resources, stabilization, if in times of crisis, and, and to uh, allocating revenue equitably. I think what aid does worldwide is all of that at the same time. And if you read the aid through these three functions, it's interesting. In terms of allocating revenue, private markets will not be allocated. If, money where the social benefits are for the it's true for the environment for the poverty and for companies in various geographies so there is a function of aid which is used as a catalyst for private decisions so that capitals can go uh, to the right place as it were and aid is starting to play that role and using public money to encourage private companies it, it, that's what it's really about so this function, I feel, is very important in terms of the typology. The second function is stabilization. We all see as soon as there's a crisis, whether it be pandemic or something else, we have to mobilize uh, financial um, assets for countries that can't, can't do that themselves. And that's a role of stabilization at its best. It's a Keynesian, uh, in poor, you know, poor countries don't have the means. And that's also important. And, and also, and break... Uh, Sharing revenue it goes a bit more than that. Solidarity 
is a view on social injustice and equality. And that's an important function as well. So these three functions define a type of activity, which is a bit different than yours, but it's interesting as well. And I'd like to get back to that idea of convergence in my last uh, quote. Once we have a nomenclature, the question that may arise is this is this the nomenclature we need or should we adopt it because there are these three reasons for being should we talk about dividing uh, work multilaterals have a more specific role to play about allocating revenue not only multilaterals but also development banks in banks because of their financial competencies so they can analyze risk but if you're allocating resources you have to do a risk analysis because you're taking risks so the idea is to pay using public money to take a risk that the private sector will not want to take. So there's a, a business which is analyzing risk, which is really what a development bank has is, is inherited. So this is the question. Once you have the typology, do we get organized as a function of that, or do you use the division of labor between the people involved, which is another possibility. The second series of comments is about the way we do this. You can't think about the purpose without the way you do it. And here I would like to make three little comments. The first being to, to the whole idea of ownership and appropriation. We talked about, uh, I think that's fundamental. We haven't gone through to the very end of that. We, we, we're paying lip service to it. We're for appropriation or onboarding. But once you said the word, what do you do? What do you do for beneficiary countries? And because we're still using a prescriptive approach, and I think we need to re uh, turn that over. Uh, and now what about knowledge? Uh, it, this is worldwide, but the use of knowledge, you know, if you're talking about knowledge for development, it's not, it is lo localized, it's social. And it determines both the analysis of problems that Mr. Zongo spoke about, but also the whole idea of priorities, which are not the same as ours. These are the priorities of countries in the undergoing development. So if you want to have the mastery of that, we have to have the capacity to do that. And the global development that we're in, I invite you to, to pay more attention to the GDM. This is, this is a crying need to increase capacity and, do, and think and, and do research on southern countries. The last one is about uh, objectives. Somebody said it talked about convergence. And I'm wondering today in, the, in our world and all of the questions we have about growth and the environment, I'm wondering what are we converging towards? How do we measure the level of standard of living we want to converge to? And I think we need to converge upwards, but maybe not according to the same definition of growth that we've had in the past. And I think that today, the objective is not to converge to an American life lifestyle. I don't think it's uh, doable or even desirable. We are below 80% now. We're not 100%. Even in developed nations, there's no total conversion. So the objective of conversions, I might want to call that a bit into question. You know, what we need is to redefine growth in terms of uh, well-being and and. and and I'd like to stop at that point. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre, for some very interesting uh, subjects, which are, I don't know. We have another person online. So, so we're on time in the first round table. And to stick to the program, I suggest uh, that we stop at this point and we can have uh, some informal exchanges during this time. We'll stay here because we can have some informal discussions for a quarter of an hour break. And we can keep up the discussion and we'll have another panel discussion depending on the time uh, after that, we can maybe have a, a, a Q and A session about all of the things we've exchanged about in the meeting today. I hope that we'll be able to uh, just tie everything together in some way. So let's take this quarter of an hour break.
and we will start up again for the next panel. Thank you. For cette seconde partie de for coming back for the second part of our first session of events and uh, financing international development. The first theme was financing world policy. Why? And the second part would be financing world policy, but for whom? And you have to recognize that in the preparation of the summit, the question of mobilization of resources was all important, leaving a bit of uh, leaving aside for the moment the question of the breakdown between countries, and dividing up things up between these countries, and that's what we're going to be talking about now. Because if there has to be a financial pact, which is what the project is about, we have to talk about the countries uh, which where what counts is whether who is who's going to be getting the money. So there are countries that are vulnerable, external or natural, and uh, there are various types of shocks. So the idea is how do you reach vulnerable countries? Uh, how do you deal with vulnerability? in uh, allocating uh, concessions in finance in a fair way and an effective way and in a transparent way. I'm going to sit down now. Do, do we have any light? As we, I don't know with, with the lights on, is it any better? Because we were we had a bit of a backlight. Present in our discussions today, left to right, we have who is a former general secretary of the ACP group in Brussels, Desiree Cachaloum, who is the director of mobilization and funding at the African Development Bank, who is next to who's a director and special counselor for the president of the AFBD. AFDB. We'll be presenting him in the discussion. And Jean-Louis Arcon, who's the new president of the Global Development Network, the GDN, who's, uh, taken, uh, who's taken over from Pierre Jacquet, who was the previous president of the GDN. Jean-Pierre Landau is ill and uh, was not able to attend this evening. And we hope to he'll be back uh, for other events. In the note that we passed around that you looked at, there are four questions that are being examined. The first is, should we target a certain category of uh, vulnerable countries or vulnerability as, as such? The idea, should we should have a category uh, type approach to countries or we're talking about vulnerability only and what i think is that the categories are useful and necessarily necessary but they're not enough to talk about vulnerabilities. what categories do we have we have the category of the the, the least developed countries the un system which includes vulnerability um, it's a, a human capital index as well. But this doesn't mean that there are a lot of countries that are very vulnerable and not very rich, that are outside of the category amongst those who are graduated recently from the category, which is a big problem, a policy problem posed by these small countries or sometimes insular countries. How do you recognize their vulnerability? It is in these very countries that are insular whether they were uh, low-income countries or not. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So while waiting for the LDC category in the most vulnerable countries, the least advanced, 
But it might be conceivable if there was not a strong enough. We might have rules for identifying these countries. Now, multilateral development banks have, for confession purposes, they have criteria, which are generally that of uh, income per capita. The African bank, which is not exactly the criteria of weak, low revenue that, that is used internationally by and determined by the World Bank. But these are you know, easy to use criteria that are unavoidable that we need to add to eligible countries, small countries uh, on an ad hoc basis. But it should be noted that these two multilateral banks for the concessions purposes and the African Development Fund, who's present at my left, on my left, have added various denominations over years, uh, uh, fragile states. They passed in review all, all the various naming conventions that have been used in a way to take into account one form of vulnerability, which is the fragility of a government um, for specific allocation purposes. But even if this approach treats subcategories within the category of low revenue, were applied to other types of vulnerabilities such as climate, which is totally invisible for vulnerable uh, countries that are vulnerable to climate change. And this would not be an adequate response if, if it's limited in this way. Vulnerability in, in allocation purposes requires double a uh, double issue here. Either you're in it or you're out of that category. There might be intermediary states, which is the case. Uh, there are criteria of graduation, different grades of, uh, of uh, LDCs. So in the categories and subcategories, we're not dealing with the allocation between countries. In other words, all of the countries that are in a category are not vulnerable. So we need to get interested in the difference in the, this heterogeneous uh, difference between uh, countries in terms of the aspect of vulnerability. So in terms of eligibility to funding, thinking in, in terms of um, importing, the importance of allocation in different countries, including vulnerability, these criteria are indispensable. So why, second question, why is vulnerability needs to be taken into account on the level of the country? As you know, this is a risk for a country to be sustainably affected by exogenous shocks. This has been deeply looked into in, in literature. And these shocks are more and more significant. And this vulnerability concerning not only the economic growth, which is interrupted sustainably, and sustainable development in the broader sense of the term. It should be noted that the way in which uh, vulnerability is dealt with in determining uh, LDCs, it's, it's kind of a series of factors that goes beyond um, which cannot be modified immediately by an act of will on the part of the countries. So this idea of vulnerability Below which, you know, for reasons of, of equity, um, kind of a compensation from the international community has not been dealt with and not been adequately taken into account in the allocation criteria of financial institutions. Or inter this is an, an old discussion we've had. And so why this growth on the part of multilateral banks, taking into account the vulnerability, 
This is not this is not a general resistance. It's recognized by the World Bank and the African Bank. We've introduced this criteria of vulnerability. So the, the European Union in the last facts, the last uh, cooperation instrument for development and the new instruments now, which is maybe less transparent, have even introduced an indicator of vulnerability, which they were advised to do uh, at the time by the uh, by the UN and the uh, UNDCP. I can see three. The first was very often expressed is that introducing a vulnerability criteria and allocating funding could be a kind of a, a, a in competition to, uh, and to the detriment of performance. So that would be the major allocation in terms of revenue in the work that we've done. At, ba, at Basel, we were able to demonstrate that the proper manipulation of variables and coefficients could make it possible to reconcile the taking into account of the full taking into account, not undiminished performance, and that of vulnerability uh, in the same way, as a way of uh, establishing a trade off between countries that are more or less vulnerable, but do perform and so forth. So, in my way of thinking, this is a, a, a useless discussion. The real issue of reticence is, you know, we're doing allocations, but what, what's that, what good is that? They're more or less used or not used, and there, there is, is there capacity for absorption? Well, that's an old argument, which is used to have this carried over to the, but the capacity for absorption to, for non-payment is at least to be shared between investors and receiving countries. It's a question of adapting procedures and targeting, uh, appropriate targeting of funding. And lastly, there's a third argument which we've heard, but vulnerability, how are you gonna measure that vulnerability? Well, you can, you can have an indicator. For 10 years, we've done a lot of work on these indicators. And they are extremely relevant, and they're likely to be divided uh, by the types of formulas being used. And the third thing is, what are the characteristics that need to fill, need to be fulfilled in terms of, of vulnerability? The response that's fashionable today is to say, well, it has to be multidimensional. That's the, that's a buzzword today. We're thinking about this in the level of the UN that we've been participating in since the very beginning. We need to have a vision of vulnerability, which combines the three dimensions traditionally considered by economists, the economic vulnerability, the shock uh, uh, vulnerability, which is on the scene today, is the one having to do with climate change. There are other vulnerabilities as well which uh, moderating the creation of special facilities, the fragility, political fragility. So there are three dimensions here. And in the work that was done by the Commonwealth and Abu the indicator as the Universal Vulnerability Index. In, in the ongoing work with a panel of high, uh, high a top level panel, where, whether it be the UN and so forth, this is the multi-dimensional vulnerability. So there are three components to the index. There are three dimensions that are economic, climate, and environmental, and the third, social and political, linked mainly and mainly centered on security issues. The problem being that the other characteristic of the indicator to be able to be used as an allocation, it has to be they cannot, the idea is that that money cannot be manipulated by an outside uh, actor for exogenous in factors independent of the political uh, will of, of the state to, uh, to risk uh, any type of, to avoid the, this type of risk. Of, uh, it's a bit arbitrary, but it's relatively easy for vulnerability in climate change. We know that there are manifestations that do not really depend on the will of the government and a bit more difficult for a political vulnerability. And at this point, for example, with recurrent uh, violence or problems on the borders, which can either be 
aggravating factors of vulnerability as well. So this is an important factor. There's a kind of a contagion in vulnerability linked to violence and a lack of uh, security. So this indicator, they should be, you need to separate these out if, if it's exogenous, independent of policy, and it has to be essential so it can be validated and usable in that funding. It has to be universal. In other words, it can't be designed only for a category of country because those would be the small reactionary countries that push for the adoption of that type of definition of vulnerability. But in fact, it was agreed in insular countries, if we want to compare vulnerability of countries, the criteria have to be universal and they have to be able to be applied just about anywhere. And I think uh, if we are to succeed in this endeavor, and this has been ongoing for 15 months now, we have to reach very soon um, with the member states by the time the summit rolls around by the end of the month of June. So it's an issue that is very fashionable these days because several of us were at Doha on the LDC conference last uh, week, and many people have been talking about organizing a panel the General Secretary of the Commonwealth and the OEF to push forward the idea that is very important in the dialogue in this perspective that we're, start, we're starting to run, we're running out of breath. Uh, we're not going to call this the Macron Conference, but it's a summit on funding and multilateral funding. And I think that there's going to be something new in this landscape with the production this year. And the last point, because I'm speaking too much, the criteria used, uh, the vulnerability has to be adapted to the financial instruments used. If you look at climate change and funding thereof, that we talked about Friday, and we'll talk about Friday, the, the allocations are not the same, whether it be attenuation or compensation. I think that this is a topic we'll talk about, but for attenuation or remediation, we're looking for efficacy in terms of reducing emissions. So there's a whole question of physical vulnerability to climate change that we have to take into account on a priority basis for compensation is something else again. We'll talk about that Friday, and it's not certain, as so clear, as the minister said very clearly earlier, we do not mean a curative vision, but a preventive vision of things. In that case, we need to call upon criteria that are ex ante uh, uh, when talking about climate change. So in guise of... I'd like to say once again that the allocation, the final allocation between countries as it was the case in old times, involves a consensus, an international consensus, not only on the rules to access eligibility to these resources, but also, and above all, to continue these allocations. And in, in income per capita is one criteria, that even if it's e easier to define you know, in revenue and development, it will also remain an essential criteria, but criteria of vulnerability needs to be added to the uh, criteria of uh, revenue per capita because it's, it's exogenous uh, so that uh, we can avoid the whole morality issue. So these criteria take into account the various forms of vulnerability, uh, climatic, uh, security, and so forth. And to be fully consistent, they need to be applied to all uh, the concessional uh, financing. And one suggestion I would allow myself to uh, to provoke you with to banks, if the multilateral development banks want to be candidates for managing new resources, then they need to show that goodwill by applying these criteria in their own allocations. We can talk about that perhaps later to see what your reactions are. But there's a challenge which is, needs to be in, entered into by the development banks for reasons of consistency. We can't be candidates 
to manage uh, vulnerability funds if we don't have allocation rules that involve those very criteria. One last remark, which joins uh, with the John Michel's conclusion earlier, which is echoes that to involve the international community, we don't know what's going to happen in this uh, to modify behavior. But let's be transparent. D depending on the implementation of the principles that were announced, and I th think in looking at the mapping and the assessment of the quality of concessional flows that the OECD provides, or that could provide other organisms, organizations, for each the funder, their allocation has to take into account the criteria of vulnerability would be another way of designing what we used to call uh, selectivity of aid in turn to make it compliant with the governance uh, indices so here again the, the financial resources on a universal basis such allocations should be uh, go along with uh, commitments and not just serve on mobilization of resources but also uh, specific allocation rules so maybe I can hand over maybe first to the African Development Bank because I've slightly teased them, but it's a debate we already had in the past. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Minister. First of all, let me stress that uh, I speak here. Uh, my, in a personal capacity, we have the governor of the, the development bank uh, who's here, uh, and obviously I will not be speaking on behalf of the bank, but on my in my personal capacity. So I would really encourage you to read this paper. It's very well written, and start maybe with the bi bibliography. It is uh, an amazing testament to Patrick Guillaume's uh, contribution to this body of knowledge, and I'd like to congratulate him and thank him for this. We've had a lot of discussions, which I really appreciated, but today I am not going to dwell on all technical considerations. I, I just would like to make three comments. First, a general one, but first, as regards what we do and uh, what I've done in the last nine years, that is uh, guiding the, recon the replenishment of the reconstruction of the ADB, uh, fragility and vulnerability are at the heart of our work. And, and fundamentally, we are not in disagreement, but then there's the way we apply these principles, which, and sometimes it's slightly different. And Patrick also knows that uh, uh, there are things that we sometimes do uh, technically that uh, are similar to what uh, he advocates. Now, um, it's not only for a development bank to adapt or decide not to adapt a criterion. Uh, now, I... Uh, I think this is where we should really um, delve further into this analysis, but uh, the political economy of uh, reconstruction, of replenish replenishment is very important. You have a wide spectrum of donors and a large spectrum of funds. You can, you can actually see this on a map, a diagram, donors and funds. A fund that would change autonomously without causing any changes in other funds would uh, be facing trouble. That's what economists call a coordination issue. So there would be a first mover disadvantage. You've given the example of, of a fund and, and uh, we're talking about small funds. And I have a lot of respect for the Caribbean fund. I have a lot of friends who work there, but it's a small one small in terms of volume. As regards uh, the, the uh, FEM, it's, uh, it's different. Political economy plays a major part here. 
So when you make a proposal for this uh, replenishment, there are two key aspects. First, you need to come to an agreement on strategic arguments. And clearly, everything related to fragility, to regional operations, we'll come back to this, all of this is important, but it has to be simple. And about uh, performance, um, no one, no bank or no one can talk to their ministers or parliament, those who will sign off uh, uh, these deals and just say that's it. And I, I'm, I'm speaking here on, on the basis of my own experience. I, I'm not going to uh, dispute what Patrick said technically. I, I used to teach at university and I, I used to be a specialist, but my experience suggests that if you do not have a simple proposal that uh, the man on the street can understand, it's, it's pointless. Because if you do this, eventually, it's Ivory Coast that will um, that will be at the receiving end, because you will have a lower replenishment. If you have a lower replenishment, you have less funds for developing countries. So I do agree with you, but let me really allow me to share my experience, my practical experience with you, and it, and it suggests my experience suggests that there has to be a consensus. And this consensus is out of reach if they are fuzzy. In English, we people say fuzzy considerations. Something that, that means not having one clear cut message, and that's it. And I really wanted to stress this point, and researchers can really include this in their work. So the political economy, uh, the political economy of this issue is not something to be neglected. It's not only a technical issue. That's my first point. Second, no one is calling into question the importance of fragility and vulnerability. Um, I prepared an example, and I was uh, very happy to get uh, to know the uh, former a minister of Guinea, because I wanted to use this example. And, and that's also what uh, one of the previous speakers, uh, uh, Tersha Zongo, said uh, in his opening remarks. You can try to solve the issue of fragility with allocations that can be regarded as uh, uh, D, uh, SDRs uh, uh, that draw from countries' uh, budgets, or you can ask yourself, how can we create domestic capacities to better use uh, these countries' resources? And now I've, uh, I've looked at the portfolio of uh, what uh, the uh, ADB has done, what the uh, ADF has done, so not the bank, the fund. And actually, I came across the example of Guinea. Last year, uh, your former employers, uh, the Arbitration Court of Guinea, issued a ruling. Maybe many of you are aware of this. So there were two mining concessions that had been withdrawn by Guinea. And the concession holder, I won't give their names, but uh, the concession holder took the government to court. We're talking about a lot of money. The concession holder had sold 51% of one of the concessions, and the value of this 51% was twice Guinea's annual budget, twice the annual budget of Guinea. For one year. Now, you might be wondering, why am I talking about this now? Guinea did not have the money to pay for this trial. It was impossible. It's the... African Development Fund, the ADR, that worked with the African uh, uh, support facility that pay for legal fees. But it was not an allocation. We didn't say we have an allocation for Guinea. We said we have this facility and it will work with countries whenever there are 
cases like this one, which show some vulnerability and technical deficiencies. And we're talking about a lot of money here. And we do this behind closed doors. It's confidential. It happens uh, in the highest spheres uh, of the state. And we fix things. My second comment, Patrick, is you and I don't disagree. It's, it's just that there are other avenues than saying, let's use a metric and let's use a rule. You can create institutions which, as uh, Tersha Zongo said, listen to their clients, their customers. And the client here said, I need this service. And we met uh, it's their demand. My last point, and then I'll be done. ODA, if you create a, a direct drawing right on it, my humble, my humble opinion is, especially as regards fragile countries, my humble opinion is that you will not make the most of it. You must be creative and wonder how you can uh, leverage this. How can you attract the private sector? How can you innovate and do something else? And that's what we did. That's what the World Bank group did. We had done this uh, before, then we uh, talked to the World Bank. So we have the private sector facility. The WB has uh, the private sector window. We have uh, uh, Mr. Umuru, who's here. You know this better than I do. And the question is, how can you secure funds that uh, allow development banks. And I think that's what you meant, uh, Madam Governor. How can you have funds that will attract the private sector to the country? That's what the OECD representative said. It's not 200, 300, 400 million euros that will cause, that will make this happen. We're talking about trillions of dollars here. So my humble opinion here is that we do agree all of this is important. But I don't think that we should boil down the discussion to uh, simply criteria and formulas. We should ask ourselves the following question. If we have, for example, 10 billions from our donors, what are we going to do with it? How can we turn it into $100 billion? The weakest countries, and we have a lot of examples. We set up an institution, and, and Gautier can talk about it. Uh, so it's the Afri it's AFOA, African Finance, Affirmative Finance for Women in Africa, AFOA. We allow banks to uh, issue, uh, to extend loans to women with, it's, it's soft loans. So you see, Patrick, it's a different way of trying to fix the problem. We don't only use formulas. My last point, and this is my, my fear. My fear is that climate funds may not actually be additional ones, and that a vulnerability criterion is going to be added to climate funds. And I'm not talking again on 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 behalf of the bank. And uh, you know, in English, we would say this is window dressing. That's my main misgiving my largest my biggest fear that's why i think we need to distinguish here we need to distinguish the debate on climate we from the technical debate on vulnerability we really need to make a distinction here because climate funds are not the oda that we've known in the lux in the last 60 years it is a far cry from it's completely different and volumes are really, and uh, well, Madam Minister mentioned regional issues. Well, that's another way of looking at uh, vulnerability aspects. But again, let's not use formulas, let's uh, categorize projects. So, in a nutshell, we do agree vulnerability and fragility are at the very heart of everything we do, everything. We have uh, an aid allocation formula that uh, factors in vulnerability. It's not what you have, it's not perfect, it can be improved. But I think that from now on, 
we should focus our efforts elsewhere. We should focus on the three points I've mentioned. And people here have a lot of expectations there of it from us. And I do hope that the summit will allow us to meet this objective. Well, thank you very much, Desiree. We have to listen to other speakers, and I, I, I won't start the debate now, but uh, just a few uh, transitional, just a few comments for uh, our transition. The uh, political economic aspects was also uh, where I was so involved in what I said. But uh, we need clarity and transparency for the political economics of uh, this. You, you said that there's no action, but the, the main risk that we will be discussing for climate finance is to see these resources uh, uh, be donated to countries that are not poor and vulnerable. Obviously, if we do not have allocation rules, it will be easier to launch projects or even to leverage funds from the private sector in countries that have capabilities. So allocation criteria are a way of uh, uh, encouraging uh, uh, donors like uh, the ADB to really think about the, the final recipient of resources and to try and, and use this leverage effect sufficiently for these countries. So it's all about, uh, it's a political economic aspect. And if we want to mobilize support uh, with the parliament, with parliaments, with uh, the public opinion on uh, the uh, acquisition of new financial resources, well, they must uh, be clear, they must be, must be certain that it's the countries that need this money that will get it. But we'll we'll continue the debate later. Biwanu, do you want to take the floor? Thank you. Uh, I'm thrilled that I can talk just after Desiree. Uh, we've already had to, to work together when I, I was... Uh, in the ACB, we worked on uh, vulnerability-related issues, but also on, on more general issues. Um, I've had the, the great fortune of uh, serving in 79 countries in, in different capacities. In the, my last position, I uh, led uh, the technical delegation uh, for uh, COP21, which was my past of, part of my uh, remit. But also, I was responsible for helping them negotiate access to funding for the private sector. We were in uh, talks with our European partners, and we were trying to really uh, have this evolution with this with the European Commission. Uh, it, it was it was amazing, uh, and the European Commission has been working for ten years with the private sector. And so we thought to ourselves, how can we do this to make sure it benefits uh, our countries as much as possible? Also, another aspect that we worked on with our European partners, it was uh, the last uh, rebound, uh, what we called the last rebound. Uh, especially after the 2008 food crisis, how could we uh, uh, readapt uh, the, the, the fund, uh, the, the flex uh, fund uh, that could uh, uh, respond to exogenous shocks that affect our countries? And how could we find the most appropriate way of defining this response? It shouldn't be counter-cyclical, but uh, it should uh, uh, be respond in due time. So at the time we looked for criteria, and uh, well, we worked with our European colleagues. We would factor in uh, famine, food security, but, and also natural disasters. And we were surprised because they came to our meetings and uh, one of the criteria was uh, the death toll. How can you determine access to funds only on the basis of the death toll from a natural disaster? So, there are countries that uh, have uh, had uh, preparedness, uh, good preparedness policies. Uh, uh, they may not have a lot of uh, death, uh, but a lot of uh, damage in terms of infrastructure. And these countries would not receive uh, a lot of uh, aid. So you, so you see, these uh, considerations uh, are not insignificant. And uh, I, I can relate to what Desiree said. 
Um, we, I think we quite agree on the predictability of criteria. It can be a criterion or it can be an allocation category to, to define fragility. For example, institutional fragility. You mentioned Guinea, for example. Well, there are uh, ways of uh, trying and define uh, uh, the aid, uh, uh, aid that can be granted to a country. Uh, so it's exactly what uh, we do, for example, uh, uh, in uh, humanities or in human sciences when uh, we protect vulnerable people. So we try to protect the people uh, through the law. We try to protect them from uh, external uh, adverse influence. So here, we try to define categories whereby we can use uh, uh, funds, uh, depending on circumstances, but also we need to uh, prepare for emergencies. But um, I'd like to talk about what uh, about a question you asked, Patrick. How can you add, uh, allocate funds between vulnerable countries? I suppose uh, this is a question for us to answer, uh, countries of the South, somehow. I think that uh, former Prime Minister Zonga said it, and the, the minister, Madam Minister, also said it. And I think Gandhi said, I think he said this, everything you do for me, without me, will be against me. We already did this at the WTO. We tried to define uh, a new category, uh, so uh, so what we call SVs, small vulnerable economies. And uh, one knows how difficult it is to negotiate on categories at WTO, but we we, we did made it. And I, I I need to give credit to ACP uh, to the ACP group. Um, we had in uh, the ACP group the, the, the wide majority of uh, LDCs. We had four fifths of uh, uh, SI of ZIDs. Uh, nearly all landlocked countries are in this group. And I thought if we continue to develop in the WTO as developing countries, that means we if, that means we would have China with us. Well, we'll never find an solution. We'll never have a, a special differentiated treatment that reflects our difficulties. So you cannot redefine. Really uh, special differentiated treatment without changing categories. So we came to this conclusion and we managed to define a category uh, to countries uh, for which uh, uh, that uh, do not account for more than 0.16% of global trade. So we, we see we managed to pull this up once. So I think that's the other side of the debate. You probably know that uh, uh, it, I said uh, during an interview that uh, if the ACP group were well organized, it could become the OECD of countries of the South. Why did I say this? Because I think that's what, miss what's, what is missing on the global agenda today. Something that's, I mean, who speaks on behalf of vulnerable countries? See, I, I was joking with my uh, uh, colleague earlier on now. And I said that, you know, the, the Secretary of State mentioned uh, the visit of uh, the PM of uh, the Barbados in, in, in Paris. By the developing countries for a survival and potential economic growth. You see here, you you're, you can't even be sure that what you're going to do will uh, have an effect. I, I, and I, I think I could, but I tried to, I, my answer was, what should we do then? My point is, obviously, we have to define criteria. We did, but well, there are nearly all Africans here because, you know, jean louis went to Cameroon and uh, et cetera. So we're, we're starting to really get into this debate. And if we, even if we refer to the Declaration of Paris, you know, it says that uh, uh, recipients uh, have a right uh, and, and also donors have to make sure that uh, results are uh, monitored and uh, identified. Well, how can we also, as recipient countries, how can we identify uh, results and uh, issue reports? I think that uh, once we do this, um, 
well, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the BH does it. Um, and and so uh, there's no reason why there should be any collaboration between uh, ADB or the Caribbean uh, Development Bank. But who will manage this? And and uh, how can we present reports to these institutions? So I think that's what we need institutionally. And how can we do this without creating new institutions yet again? Because that's what we want to avoid. This this is a blind spot in the institutional uh, landscape. And I'd like us to explore this. And we should ask also uh, the, the, this question. Before, you know, when you call Europe, you, you know, when you call Europe, the EU uh, picks up the phone. When you call vulnerable countries, who's going to pick up the phone? That's my main point. Thank you very much. Well, currently, the alliance of uh, governments and, and insular companies, because those states are organized. But as I was saying earlier, there are no categories of vulnerable countries. And this uh, category was not to say that it was un useless because they're necessary, but they're useful as well because their support measures are sometimes binary, which is uh, which the case of which you're aware of is either you benefit from it or you don't. You're in it or you're out of it, which applies to any ACP countries. <laughs> The OECs don't have a, a small uh, in the Maldives, uh, right they're in the ACP. You know why? Because they find it's the only secretariat which is able to speak uh, uh, outside of the OECs. Let's continue our roundtable discussion with Jean Louis Racon, who is a professor. He is still in the Institute of the High the development studies in Geneva. He's, a, he's in charge of the Global Development Network, succeeding to uh, Mr. Arcon, the floor is yours. I'm going to try to be brief. I'm going to divide my remarks into three parts, three little proposals. The last one will be a real proposition in our sense of the term. The first point, and I'm getting back to what Desiree was saying. <laughs> We're getting old. We, we've known each other for a long time. One of the intellectual contributions of Patrick is the discussion about aid, not seeing aid as just a transfer, but as a transfer which has a function of an insurance uh, contract, which uh, faces up to risk. And that's going to be what is going, what I'm going to talk to you about is going to hinge on. The vulnerability is what? It's the probability of uh, going under a certain, a certain threshold, which could be defined in whatever way. So the probability of falling under a threshold in any probabilistic model, model in the world it depends on what? It depends on the moment of this random variable. It depends on the variance of that random variable. Or to put it more precisely, it depends on the risk. Because the risk, increase of risk increases the variance. It's a famous example of the regretted Jean-Luc Jean Lafont spoke about this. The other characteristic which determines the vulnerability is what we call in English, is not really a good transaction, in English, is the downside risk, which corresponds to another statistics term, uh, to the skewness. But it's not the same thing. The reason for which I'm talking about this, because definitions are important, is that assigning aid on the basis of vulnerability is so obviously for, is so obvious for any economist or anybody who's worked in social sciences who knows anything about it. The preferences of different people include the risk. So not including vulnerability in the decisions for assign, allocating 
whether it be just a transfer or whether it be the object of an insurance contract, it's even clearer if it's an insurance, but, but obviously vulnerability has to be there. I would like along the same lines to refer to a remark that Jean-Michel made about his paper about Sylvian, because it was something that really woke me up. He made a Jura distinction in some in a certain way between Jeremy Bentham and John Rawls. And what's uh, unusual here, uh, when Jean-Michel was presenting their paper, the only thing I could see in front of me is that economists, it's a, it's a, how do we aggregate the preferences of everybody in society? How do we add together all the preferences of all countries, the rich countries and poor countries? The, the well-being, social well-being that we have in mind. And that Sylviane, she's sitting here, so I, I can't see Jean-Michel, but the function of, of uh, social well-being when you talk about convergence is probably a function of Benthamite. We're maximizing the average. So then you talked about Rawls implicitly. Jean-Michel did it. It's implicit in what you say, that uh, solidarity base translated into mathematical terms is what? It's the, it's the, it's the maximizing the well-being of the one that is the worst, that's in the worst situation. Okay? So when you think of allocating aid, uh, redistributing, which is an insurance contract, you have to take that into consideration. It's the objective function of each government in the international community. And then you need to, what remains is to determine the, the well-being factor to allocate aid. Are you maximizing the average well-being? Are you maximizing the worst uh, well, uh, original uh, well-being? And now, in the paper we saw this morning, beginning of the afternoon's proceedings, there was something that was even more rich that could be said in terms of why. My last, uh, the last thing I wanted to say is going to be what is the involvement of the theory of risk and the, th and the basic insurance theory as I taught for 10 years to students at the Magister of the SLD and for 15 years a master's students in, in Geneva. A, a famous theorem um, from 1964, it was a very good year. It was my da date of birth, so it was a good year. So the Pratt theorem was a famous paper in that in economics. So the Pratt theorem says that the insurance premium I hope you can see that aid is like insurance, okay? And the amount of aid is like in a premium of the insurance that is paid by the rich countries for the poor countries. Visualize it that way. The Pratt's theorem says that the insurance premium, which would be aid, is linearly proportional to the variance of the shock that will be uh, subject to. So here we're, is the perfect correspondence between the of, uh, aid being kind of insurance, but there's a second determinant of the amount of the premium in this insurance. So in the whole uh, the view of this aid, uh, and we're looking at aid, the second variable is gonna be affecting the premium is the aversion, risk aversion of the beneficiary. And getting back to what was said by my two colleagues here, Mr. Zongo earlier, aversion to risk are the preference of the uh, beneficiary countries. Obviously, the more a country is vulnerable, the more it should receive aid. That comes from the the basic insurance thing. But Kitaris Paribus, 
two countries that have the same vulnerability, the one that's more afraid of risk should also receive more money. So how can we decide which, which country has the more risk phobia relative to different countries in the world? I'd give you one exit for this uh, dilemma, which gets back to well-being, social well-being. This is pure logic. There's a famous paper from Kenneth Arrow, which many of you know was not exactly uh, so stupid. Maybe the best of us in, 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 in economics, amongst the best of us intellectually. Kenneth Arrow wrote a well-known, but maybe not that well-known, because you probably don't know, in the Journal of Philosophy 73. There's a demonstration in three lines. He demonstrates that when you have a function of well-being, uh, bentamite, so we're maximizing the average uh, in society, when you, you extend the risk of phobia to in, in infinity, you wind up with roles. In a certain sense, from the point of view of uh, allocating aid, here we're maximizing in this reasoning this would lead us to number one take the risk in consideration so vulnerability obviously it's a no-brainer and secondly we need to maximize the well-being of the country in the worst situation in terms of that transfer because that's the only logical thing to do because otherwise each noise is going to say i'm more afraid of risk than you and I deserve more. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you for bringing us back to uh, some basic uh, basics in economic philosophy. And, and risk aversion is uh, very important, not only for countries, but there's a risk aversion which is structural in uh, lenders in, or in, in funders. And I think that uh, risk aversion on the part of institutions can also be a problem that needs to be dealt with in the uh, architecture dealing with international funding. We have uh, 20, 15, 20 minutes left. There's a bit of uncertainty about the time we were supposed to finish. Some people thought it was uh, 6 p.m. and others thought it was uh, there are some people have, having to leave, I see. We have a time to take a few questions, I think, and then we'll hand back over to our panel members. Who would like to, to speak? Mr. Gauthier. Mr. Gauthier Boulard. Thank you so much, Professor Yumo. And thanks to Ferdi for organizing this conference of great interest and which is happening at the right time, given what's at stake in the crisis we're aware of and this conference, which uh, is going to be held in June. I don't want to be too long. I just wanted to raise one or two points, and one of which I'll add a bit of information about the topic of the allocating resources in the in transitional funds. But the first point I wanted to deal with having to do with the question of the purpose of uh, development aid. This is a topic which is very seldom mentioned in this type of discussion. And the fact that we're going beyond the question of ownership and appropriation of the development project and the development projects in countries could be make it so that the countries can get a better sovereignty and better independence so that we can reinforce the sovereignty of the state the benefiting from that and not only the fact that they're integrated in the, in the design of programs, but, uh, but really in the objective of sovereignty. And I'm thinking of this having to do with the crisis that we've just been through. First of all, the COVID crisis to COVID-19, where Africa wound up at the end of the line to retain access to vaccines or mask or, or antiseptic uh, gel because of a lack of autonomy and sovereignty in access to pharmaceutical products and the whole question of uh, food security 
and the consequences of that it was again the war in ukraine which generated a major impact in the cost of food in particular the fact that africa is totally dependent at least some countries are on on food produced elsewhere either in ukraine or in russia with very severe consequences in terms of food safety so the point of sovereignty and that's what this dynamic is all about in talking about this with the african development uh, thankful about banker development uh, just to mobilize productivity of african uh, farmers to reinforce their sovereignty and the food safety as a result of that these are two examples i wanted to cite the question of health and access to vaccines and the african bank as well took a position in one area which was access to pharmaceutical products and the ability of african countries to produce themselves the pharmaceutical products of first necessity in, in vaccines. We recently created Kigali with the cooperation of the one day uh, government and the African Union, a, a foundation for pharmaceutical technologies in Africa. And the purpose of which is to negotiate with pharmaceutical production companies a transfer of rights and intellectual property such that some uh, products can be used by African researchers and produced in Africa for Africans. Here, the idea was to reinforce sovereignty of states and governments and, and multilateral banks such as the African Bank and the World Bank that certainly need to play an important role in this, in this process. Another point, uh, which was raised this morning, which can be part of the work uh, by the chair on the architecture of aid, the preference uh, as a report near the name of its drafter is uh, the Powerman report, which was drafted to the Minister of Finance, who was chair of the G20 at the time, in working on this, where we have given in good detail the distribution, the breakdown of tasks between development partners, including multilateral, mainly IMF, for macroeconomic aspects that can give an interesting contribution about the whole question having to do with dispersion and the lack of clarity with respect to distributing the roles in development that's an important point to my to my way of thinking in terms of the volume mrs minister spoke about uh, dts a very important aspect as well where the african development bank has taken a, a position on that, we developed a technical model which made it possible to fill the conditions of the IMF and the CTTS via the development bank with the big advantage of the AAA rating that they have in the bank, African Development Bank can exert a significant leverage in the sense to multiply by a factor of three or four the resources that in the CTTS that we could have, which is not the case of the uh, of the International Money Fund. So these are important points, and the, the DTTS is a point that we're working on a lot in cooperation with France. And the president of France provided a great deal of support in this respect. We're working with the European Central Bank, which has stopped uh, based on European rules, the possibility for development banks to be able to reallocate or, or to host special uh, funds. And the latest information received from the IMF was that the, the bad, but the African Development Bank is compliant with the requirements of the IMF with respect to the characteristics of this type of law. There is a difficulty for benefiting for that, but they actually, the FME gave our, their green light. So there will be an announcement of work being done in the framework of the summit um, that's going to happen in June. The last point, which I announced this information about the issue of allocating resources, concessional resources with respect to funding, the nature and the design of this model of allocating resources is in fact based essentially, in fact, almost only based as a way of compensating the the countries with the best performance, the PBA that you mentioned. Uh, assess the performance of the country with a view to giving more resources to countries that put into place the right policies and the right strategies and to improve 
the situation. So performance-based allocation, a way of compensating the good students or to penalize the bad students who get less. We realize that there's a whole category of countries we call fragile countries were receiving very little resources because they were uh, fragile. And so there was a one, uh, there's a moral uh, random event, as it were, because they were building situations with, due to external factors they're not responsible for, they can't necessarily act on. So there was something unjust about that. So we wanted to give, to propose them to have more resources by creating this involuted for this type category of countries and to allocate resources within that envelope, fragile countries are in competition between pairs. In other words, between countries that are not as performance in this specific envelope for those countries in order to obtain more resources. And it says Desiree was referring to, there's a whole series of uh, donating countries that are very attached to the idea of performance to compensate performance and partners above and beyond the Atlantic, the other side of the Atlantic are very attached to that principle. So it's very complicated to find a compromise that between the performance idea and to compensate or allocate more to the countries that need it more. So that's a dimension that we shouldn't be forgetting either in this discussion. And the last point, a minor point, I guess, but is that the allocation of resources in the framework of the concessional activities has to be an incentive. So there's a whole idea of compensating performance. So the formula has to be simple. The countries themselves have to understand it and they should know what factors they can weigh heavily on to improve their performance and to access more resources. So that's kind of the educational or the incentive to get more resources. I'm going to stop there. I know we carried on a bit, but thank you so much for the conference. It was so interesting. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Let me uh, pick up on what Desiree said. Uh, you know, I was a fundraiser with Ida for three or four times uh, a long time ago. And I'd like also to pick up on what Mr. Arcan said. And also let me add something else. Let me start with the easiest bit. We need to pick our words carefully. If we talk about vulnerability, what does it mean? That I try to attract private investors. Hey guys, I'm the most vulnerable in the world. Well, I'm not sure it's going to attract the private sector or not. And we said that uh, we hope that the trillions of dollars will come from the private sector. Well, maybe we can find a solution here somewhere. Words matter. Then criteria. Uh, I do believe a lot in uh, the probability aspect. When you have, for example, a lease uh, or something that you want to, to grant for three years, so if you look at IDA or the ADF. Well, I, I do agree with this area. It's very difficult. And also, I'd like to add to what he said about uh, political economic aspects. There's also the political economics of donor countries. Well, the minister has gone, but if a country says, well, you uh, in Ivory Coast will get less money, because of the new criteria, I can tell you this is going to send some waves and it's not going, only going to be in, in donor countries. Uh, it, you know, it's like trying to square the circle. It's, it's a very difficult exercise. So there are also a lot of sensitive aspects because there will also be threshold effects. Uh, threshold effects. Well, sorry about that. Uh, you performed uh, better, but uh, be we've added a new criterion, uh, the vulnerability criterion because of this criterion and you're going to guess 30% uh, less money. It's quite difficult to explain. For um, and, and I think we need to take this into account and also probabilities. Uh, allocations that are uh, decided, not all of them are enforced, which means that uh, some, is, some, uh, some of it is kept for these events that uh, can materialize. Uh, so you can add money 
For example, if you look at the floods in Pakistan, even though Pakistan was capped, well, India and Pakistan uh, will get 50% of uh, the Isla, just the two, the, just these two countries. Well, we've uh, tweaked the system. Now you might say, you might say it, it, it's not right. Yes, but it's taken into account of the system. And if we do this, if we factor this in uh, upstream, once uh, an emergency occurs, what should you do? Do you want to factor in, or I mean, if you internalize this probability, does it mean that the event will, that all accidents will occur? So I, I think this is the right way, but we need to find the right way to translate it, to translate this into allocation mechanisms. You know, sometimes it takes years uh, to uh, plan projects, but then you might at the last minute decide to change the allocation of funds because there's, a, I don't know, an earthquake, for example. So all of this is done, but it's not a formulaic approach. It's on an ad hoc basis. Now, if we could find the uh, the right formula for this, so the magic formula, that would be amazing. But, uh, well, I, I, I believe in this. Uh, I mean, if uh, what Desiree said is true, if uh, there wasn't any vulnerability, uh, there wouldn't be any idea, etc., etc. But what do we put into the equation? Climate plus wars. Well, we already have, you know, wars, post-conflict. Okay, what do you what else do you add? Climate pandemics, because this is what we've seen in the last two years. What is the you know the scope of vulnerabilities? Well, we have macro vulnerabilities. Well, somehow it's what the IMF does. So what do you put in the kitty? Because it's very important. Uh, structural vulnerabilities, but what's structural? There are external shocks. Maybe you could do something. Uh, for example, Singapore, Singapore, there, there are lots of externalities. Well, they have readjusted. Uh, so I I don't know. I think this, this is going to be on the table because uh, there's a lot of talk about it. Now, how can we deal with this? I think I would side with Desiree because it's not easy. All the reasons he mentioned, and I can relate to that. Uh, it's all about orchestrating things, but who for, what for, and the next question will be how. Uh, you know, well, with real money, real allocations, and real latencies and probabilities that may uh, occur or not. There you go. Well, I, I don't want to extend the debate. The prime minister asked for the floor, but uh, let me just uh, let me just answer some of the points raised. Uh, uh, these are very important aspects. First, is there a signal effect uh, of vulnerability that may drive away the private sector? No. Uh, au contraire. As Jean Arcan said, uh, we should see this as an insurance. You know, uh, donors uh, are aware of, of risks in countries. So there's no point explaining risks to private investors. They're aware of them. Now, is there a conflict with performance? In an allocation formula, is uh, vulnerability in conflict with performance? Well, the work we did for uh, the African Development Bank showed that we could, we could perfectly introduce a, a structural vulnerability index without reducing the weighting of performance. It was the main conclusion of the work we did. There's always a real allocation effect. Uh, for example, amongst the most, the, 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 the most effective or highest performing countries, you might give uh, more or less between countries. And it's the same between uh, uh, lowest performing countries. There's a reallocation. And, you know, you can adjust a formula, but it has to be extremely transparent. So, and, and a lot could be said about uh, measuring performance and vulnerability. So I don't think it's a real issue it's a real conflict now I, I i totally understand you said that uh, you know people used to say that we should you should not uh, uh, tamper with performance P people in japan used to say pva is a global public good right maybe so 
you know, we uh, talk a lot about uh, uh, the Paris the declaration of the declaration of Paris, uh, and we have a, a performance indicator that's the same for all countries, and which is completely it has nothing to do with ownership. And vulnerability today is uh, is a criterion that's uh, in high demand from countries. So I think that today politically things are slightly different from uh, what they were before. That's my first point. And also, uh, I duly noted what uh, Mr. Gauthier said, which was very important, the importance of SDRs. But we'll have to work on this. Uh, Sylvian and Bruno Cabriac have uh, issued uh, a paper on this. So it, it, it's fine if uh, development banks can be uh, regarded as uh, worthy recipients by international banks, but then which countries will benefit from these allocations? And uh, in uh, Bruno, Bruno Cabriac's and Sylvian's work, there was a recommendation. Uh, irrespective of the financial intermediary, allocations should take into account the vulnerability of countries because that's why the special uh, issuance of uh, SDRs was created. It shouldn't, you, you know, we shouldn't think in a black and white manner, uh, saying, you know, we create SDRs and uh, then we don't really discuss uh, what countries will benefit from them. So about this debate, about the whole political economic aspect, I think what really matters here is to have transparent rules because the main risk today is to uh, create uh, yet more and more special funds. But who will benefit from this? The risk is that it won't be poor and vulnerable countries because uh, they don't have a lot of bargaining power. So if you don't have metrics for the administrations of multi multilateral banks to help them decide uh, where money should be sent and uh, how it should be used uh, to create uh, leverage, if, if, if we don't do this, we will, uh, we will fail. Mr. Mr. Prime Minister, Sidhu Diallo. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, a, it's an honor that you've invited me to this uh, brainstorming on uh, the mobilization and allocation of resources uh, for development of states. You've sort of uh, fixed my issue. I don't think we should uh, say that there's a conflict between uh, performance and allocation. I think we need to um, make uh, states aware of their responsibilities. A government that is not aware of its responsibilities, that uh, lets uh, corruption thrive, and that has practices that, according to question, macroeconomic stability, that, do, that does all these type of things, this, a state like that has to pay. So I think it is an incentive, an incentive for governments to conduct wise policies irrespective of the recipient sector. For example, if you want to prevent vulnerability, if you want to mitigate its impact on the living conditions of the population, well, governments have to be made responsible. And they must make a concerted effort to improve governance and to promote transparency so that uh, resources, regardless of the purpose and the recipient sector to make sure that uh, the resources are used to uh, fight or mitigate the consequences of uh, vulnerabilities or events, but also to improve the overall living conditions of populations. I think we need to strike the right balance between the need to uh, fight and reduce vulnerabilities, but also to uh, incentivize governments to improve their governance. We've also received questions on Zoom, but we won't have time to answer them. One of the questions was actually about uh, the criteria. What vulnerability criteria should be taken into account? It was a question from Emile Cablan. Well, I would encourage you to uh, read uh, uh, works uh, done uh, by the UN and, and Ferdi about existing criteria, uh, pros and cons. The papers that deal with 
vulnerability in the traditional sense of vulnerability to uh, e economic or external shocks, but also vulnerability to uh, climate change and also political vulnerability, criteria of vulnerability to uh, security risks specifically. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to dwell on this because time flies and uh, we'll soon have to leave uh, the meeting, uh, this venue. So I think you wanted to take the floor. So make it quick, please, says the speaker. Is it working? Yes, it's working. Yes, I, I, may I suggest that we come back to this very important uh, concept that you referred to, aid as an insurance premium that is paid for by humankind to countries that need it. And I, I think it's, it's, it's a great approach. That being said, there's something which hasn't changed uh, since the invention of aid on this planet. The population is growing. We have uh, a net population increase of 150 million people per annum. It was less 20 years ago. It will be less in 20 years from now. And it's now that we have the largest number, the largest number of people who have to find their rightful place on this planet somewhere. And I say somewhere. It's not it's not, for example, just Ivory Coast. No, it's going to be in a specific town or specific village. So when people are born or when they migrate somewhere, if they want to have decent living conditions, well, it, there's no it does. It's not free. There must be or there is a public an initial public investment, which uh, it, so th this is a cost for the community. And then there must be a minimum cost to ensure that uh, people become a, a decent uh, citizen and not a criminal or, or, or non entity. So people can really fit in uh, the local community. So that's what I call a local, a minimum local functioning investment. So if uh, humankind has to dedicate 1% of global wealth to this, to settling people somewhere. I'm, I'm not saying in a country, I'm saying settling people in a, in a, in a, in a village or in a, well, for example, for a country like Burundi, that's 50%, the equivalent of 50% of its annual GDP. Of course, it's not going to invest all this money. And the result is what we call in France, what we've called uh, for years, you know, when we we saw shanty towns or slums. Well, shanty towns are the uh, are the proof that at some point the government did not do what was required. So now, if you regard aid as an insurance premium, somehow you need to invent a scheme to make sure that this uh, investment is made where the population is growing most. I'm not. I'm not. I don't mean any particular country. I'm, I'm talking here more about villages and, and and that's what we need to do. We need to prepare for the future. That's what I said in this study. Uh, so prepare for the future in Western Africa. So we need to prepare for the future to make sure to avoid you know worst case scenarios and to make sure that uh, this population growth uh, goes well. And that's why you, you use this insurance premium. If you don't do it right, things will, you know, will be in you'll be in trouble. But we can also prepare for the future, and one of the uh, purposes of aid is to prepare for the future and, and to uh, appropriately distribute this investment or allocate this investment, which has to be which have to be made where population is growing fast. It's a global public good. So, if we cannot. Uh, so you're talking about the purpose of aid. Well, if I think we need to look at this through the lens of demographic growth. This is what I said in my, this is my occupational, professional testament uh, in my last work, rediscovering uh, economics to handle population growth. If you want to get the, find this book, it's quite easy. It's on sale everywhere now. Uh, it's uh, published by the Harmattan uh, I've left a few sheets. It's a bit expensive. Okay, okay. We we all we're all going to note down uh, the the references. And if you don't like it, I will repay the the price of the book. Thank you very much. It's now time to conclude this uh, conference.
we received questions, we'll try to answer them, questions that were asked on Zoom. But um, I'd like to uh, give some floor time to my panelists. I think uh, Jean, we wanted to add something, Desiree as well. Piwanu. Uh, I'm not going to talk for two minutes, just seconds. I'd like to really thank Patrick Guillemot for all his work in this area. We are here today thanks to him, and you can uh, count on us uh, to continue this debate. Thank you. Thank you. It's ideas that need support. I, I, I have exactly the same to say. Well, I think we're done then. Thank you very much. Thank you for staying until this uh, later uh, hour. And as uh, Philippe Uweru said uh, at the start of this uh, afternoon session, that uh, there will be uh, a further five events as uh, a rich of this one. The next one will be taking place at uh, the Ministry of Economics and Finance and, and other things, I think. The Ministry of Finance is in Bercy, short. Uh, next Friday, not at 2, but at 3 p.m. at the Pierre Mendes France Centre, we'll be discussing climate finance on the basis of a very interesting document, a very interesting paper by Philippe Lurieu, and uh, another paper on uh, the role of uh, multilateral banks in climate finance. A question that was slightly touched upon today, but that uh, uh, we will uh, delve into next Friday in the Ministry of Finances at 3 p.m. in Bercy. Make sure you sign up for the event. All information will be emailed to you if it hasn't been uh, already today. Thank you very much. Thank you to all personalities. Uh, thank you to representatives of uh, the African Bank. Uh, uh, one of our friends has already left. Thank you to Prime Minister Silu Diallo. Also, Tosh Zongo, who was with us online for most of the debate and all uh, personalities that uh, I uh, haven't been able to name, participants in the chair and in Ferdi, particularly uh, our friend Alain Leroy, who's there, is uh, given us uh, very important support, uh, support to the activities of the chair. Thank you.